My name is Carl Olson. I'm a lawyer in San Francisco. I've specialized in media law for over 20 years, and before that I was a reporter and editor for newspapers in Northern California. I'm going to cover a variety of topics today which come up for journalists in the course of news gathering, ranging from the use of confidential sources to taping interviews to gathering news on public school campuses. I'll start with confidential sources. The use of confidential sources has been an indispensable part of journalism and telling important stories since even before the founding of our country. Benjamin Franklin's brother went to jail for refusing to reveal the name of a source. John Peter Zenger, a pioneering and crusading journalist in colonial times, was prosecuted and thankfully acquitted when he wouldn't reveal the name of a source. Every day we read important stories which were made possible by the use of confidential or anonymous sources. The most dramatic example perhaps of which was the Watergate scandal and uh, the use of Deep Throat as a confidential source. Criticism of government and exposure of government wrongdoing must sometimes depend on the use of confidential sources. But the use of confidential sources should generally be the exception and not the rule. And the use of confidential sources to state opinions, particularly in a political context, should be discouraged. Editors and reporters should seriously consider the value of information received from a confidential source before deciding to print it. It's better to get something on the record and for attribution if you can. News people should consider the following before using confidential sources. A, how important is the story? Does its news value outweigh the potential damage to reader trust? B, can you change the story to avoid using a confidential source? Can you get somebody on the record for attribution? And C, have other means of getting the story and using the information been exhausted? If a reporter concludes that it's necessary to grant anonymity to get that important story, it's best to consult with your supervising editor before making such an agreement. The identity of anonymous sources should be disclosed to supervising editors and the source should be told that you're going to have to do that. Reporters should also tell the source they'll try to get others to speak on the record about the information in question. If you make a promise you can't keep, the source might sue you for breach of contract. That's what happened in the U.S. Supreme Court case, Cohen versus Cowles Communications, where someone who'd been promised anonymity sued the Minneapolis Star Tribune for publishing his name in a story, and that caused him to lose his job. So don't make promises you can't keep, and uh, don't put yourself in a position where you have to basically burn a source. Shield laws in 49 states protect your ability to use confidential sources and unpublished information. 49 states have, have enacted shield laws either by case law or by statute. And these generally protect news people against having to disclose confidential sources or surrender unpublished information, such as notes and outtakes. The coverage of these laws varies quite a bit, though. In California, Article 1, Section 2B of the California Constitution and Evidence Code Section 1070 provide an immunity from being held in contempt for reporters, editors, publishers, and other people connected with or employed by newspapers, magazines, press associations, and wire services, as well as TV or radio news reporters. The California Shield Law applies to both the source of information, your classic confidential sources, and to unpublished information such, such as notes, outtakes, unpublished photos, and tapes. 
But when a criminal defendant seeks information which is protected by the shield law, the courts have set up a balancing test between the criminal defendant's fair trial rights and, and that weighs how important the information is to the criminal defendant and whether the defendant can get the information elsewhere against the First Amendment and shield law rights which, uh, which protect journalists. A case called Delaney versus Superior Court decided by the California Supreme Court uh, enunciated that weighing process in a case in which reporters witnessed a search of a criminal defendant uh, which found brass, brass knuckles. And in that case, where the reporters were really the only witness to the search and to whether the defendant consented to the search, the court held that the criminal defendant's rights outweighed the journalist's rights. On the other hand, when the prosecution seeks information, the shield law is absolute under a California Supreme Court case called Miller versus Superior Court. And in a civil case where the press is not a party, again, the shield law is absolute. The immunity from contempt uh, trumps the civil litigant's uh, ability to get information. And that case helps journalists avoid being professional witnesses and allows them to be what they should be, which is professional journalists. Does the shield law apply to bloggers? That is a good question. Hasn't really been answered yet in California. California shield law covers people, quote, connected with or employed upon a newspaper magazine or other periodical publication. Does it apply to what the DC Circuit Court called the blogger in pajamas, that hasn't been answered yet, and uh, it, I think it's going to be a hotly litigated question. Congress has not yet enacted a federal shield law, and the extent of the shield law or the extent of protection for journalists using confidential sources is not as clear in federal courts as it is in state courts. In Brandsburg versus Hayes, a 1972 U.S. Supreme Court case, the Supreme Court did not reach a clear conclusion one way or the other. Justice Powell, who was the swing vote in that case, wrote a concurring opinion saying that even though the news person lost that case, news people are not without constitutional rights with respect to the gathering of news or in safeguarding their sources. And that became the touchstone for a generation of federal case law that found a reporter's privilege under the First Amendment in one circumstance or another. The majority of the court in Brandsburg recognized, quote, without some protection for seeking out the news, freedom of the press could be eviscerated. But some recent federal appellate court opinions have questioned whether there's a shield law, and there's a bill pending in Congress right now which would grant shield law protection at the federal level. But whether that bill is going to pass is, as, as I speak now, a very open question. The bottom line is you should be careful in a situation where you might end up in a federal court. And of course, sometimes you don't really know whether you're going to end up in federal court or state court. And as I said earlier, it's important that a reporter and an editor be on the same page and that they agree on the importance of a story and the need to use confidential sources. The next topic I'd like to talk about is taping interviews. An that's another issue that commonly arises in the course of news gathering. Can you tape a phone call with someone? The answer in California is basically not without their permission. California is a two-party consent state, which means that if you tape a call without someone's consent, you violated the law, Penal Code Section 632. So if you want to tape a call, make sure that you get someone's consent and that the consent itself is on tape. Privacy issues and things such as trespassing are another issue that commonly comes up in the course of news gathering. For example, when you're covering accidents, how much latitude do you have to cover the news without invading someone's privacy? 
A California case illustrates how difficult it can be to draw the line. That case, called Shulman versus Group W Productions, involved a mother and her son who were injured when the car in which they were riding flew off the highway and tumbled into a ditch. Car came to rest upside down and the mother was pinned under the car and had to be cut free by the jaws of life. A rescue helicopter was dispatched to the scene. A TV camera operator videotaped both the accident scene rescue and the helicopter ride. The accident victim sued both over the videotaping of the rescue and the taping of the helicopter ride. The California Supreme Court said that she didn't have a claim for the broadcast of the rescue because that was a matter of legitimate public interest and it was substantially relevant to the newsworthy subject of the piece, a broadcast called On Scene Emergency Response. The court reached a different result on the helicopter ride taping, though. Quote, in contrast to the broad privilege the press enjoys for publishing truthful, newsworthy information in its possession, the press has no recognized constitutional privilege to violate generally applicable laws in pursuit of material nor, even absent an independent crime or tort, can a highly offensive intrusion into a private place, conversation, or source of information generally be justified by the plea that the intruder hoped thereby to get good material for a news story. That was the California Supreme Court speaking, but I think a lot of times you can just use your common sense and, and just think to yourself, would someone find this highly offensive to a reasonable person. Bottom line is that you have a right to gather news in a public place, but you don't have a right to commit a trespass or to break the law trespassing into a private home or tapping a phone line to gather the news. Another issue which will commonly come up to, for a lot of reporters is access to school grounds. Journalists have a right of access to school grounds, but the issue is whether you have to register with the principal when you enter the school. California law says outsiders have to register with the principal to enter or remain on school grounds, but the law provides that journalists are not outsiders. But it's not as simple as that either, because the attorney general in many school districts take the position that journalists still have to register, and the Attorney General's opinion, which in my humble opinion is wrong, hasn't been challenged in court. It may be best to comply with the registration requirement as long as the school officials recognize your legitimate right to gather the news and, in the words of the legislature, the right to visit school grounds for legitimate nonviolent purposes. The bottom line is that I've received calls from reporters over the years who have been uh, told by school officials to leave the school when, when there's been, uh, say, you know, a shooting or something like that and the school officials feel that they're just being overwhelmed by press. And even though, uh, in my view, the law says that they can't tell you to leave if you're not disrupting school activities and they can't tell you to register, it's kind of hard to test that in court uh, on, on an emergency basis. So uh, if you can basically uh, work with the principal, even if it means registering, to, uh, to get access to the school and to be able to interview kids, you know, especially at a high school, that's the way to go about it. Another issue that comes up is access to disaster scenes. Reporters are given a right of access to disaster scenes by California law. Penal Code Section 409.5 allows law enforcement personnel to close off an area where a, quote, flood, storm, fire, earthquake, explosion, or other disaster happens. But the same law says it does not prevent representatives of a news service, newspaper, or radio or TV station from entering the closed area. Most police departments issue press credentials to implement that law and to allow you to, uh, to have a legitimate right of access when you're covering a disaster scene. 
uh, although in San Francisco, uh, the police department recently uh, sort of tried to exclude certain uh, press people from, from getting press passes, but, but the, the legitimate or mainstream media still is getting press passes and has access to that. What comes up when you're trying to use leaked information? Well, the press generally has the right to use leaked information, even when the person giving you the information may have broken the law, as long as you didn't break the law in getting that information. You may run into an issue where the government or a private party, however, will want to know the source of the information, and that subject generally is covered under the shield law in terms of uh, your ability not to reveal the source of information or unpublished information. I'd like to briefly cover access to juries and grand juries. Jurors cannot be prohibited from talking to you after the jury has been discharged. On the other hand, of course, they don't have to talk to you if they don't want to. There's also case law that gives you a right of access to jury questionnaires, although in some high-profile cases, uh, trial judges have, have not complied with that law and have tried to make it difficult for the press to cover high-profile cases. The press also has a presumptive right of access to grand jury transcripts in California once an indictment has been handed down. In order to defeat that right of access, a criminal defendant has to meet a very high burden of showing that he or she will be unable to obtain a fair trial. And even in high-profile cases that have received a lot of publicity, the courts have held that the defendant cannot make that showing and that the press should be given the grand jury transcript. Uh, it's a very difficult showing for a defendant to make that he can't find 12 impartial jurors in a large county. Uh, the, the only case that I'm aware of where the court basically ruled that you can't get the grand jury transcript is the Michael Jackson case, and the Court of Appeal in that case said, well, this is kind of a sui generis or one of a kind case. I'd like to next talk about the use of photographs. A number of legal issues are presented by the taking and use of photographs for news purposes. Generally speaking, a photographer who's taking pictures in a public place of a public event is on solid legal ground and doesn't have to get a release. For example, if you're shooting an auto accident in a public place or covering the installation of a new public officer or a press conference in a public place, of course you don't have to worry about getting a release. And in fact, the Brown Act specifically provides that anyone attending an open and public meeting of a local agency has a right to record the meeting with a tape recorder or to take pictures. The use of photographs for commercial purposes, however, is a horse of a different color. Anyone who knowing, knowingly uses someone's likeness or photograph for purposes of advertising or selling merchandise without consent can be held liable for damages under California Civil Code Section 3344. The heirs of a person whose likeness is used can also sue. The use of photographs or, uh, or a person's likeness in connection with a news, public affairs, or sports broadcast or account or any political campaign, on the other hand, is legal and consent is not required. Another issue which comes up for photographers is what I would call sort of the paparazzi situation. The California legislature, angered by the behavior of tabloid photographers and in the wake of Princess Diana's death in an auto accident, adopted a law in 1998 which restricts photographing subjects from private property. The law holds a photographer liable for invasion of privacy when he or she, quote, knowingly enters on to the land of another without permission or otherwise commits a trespass to invade someone's privacy. 
This law is aimed at photographers who capture famous actors or actresses in a, quote, personal or familial activity, end quote, like nude sunbathing or the like. The law also forbids a, quote, constructive invasion of privacy, end quote, with a visual or auditory enhancing device, like a zoom lens, if the activity could not have been captured without a trespass or the use of special equipment. There's a safe harbor in that law, though, for people photographing illegal or criminal activity. The personal and familial activity of a photographer is not allowed to capture does not include illegal or otherwise criminal activity. The last uh, thing that I would like to cover is fair use of copyrighted material. That applies to the use of both copyrighted written works and copyrighted photographs. Under certain circumstances, you can use copyrighted works without permission, but it's a complex area focusing on the purpose of your use. Using something for news is more likely to be fair use. The nature of the work you're using, if it's already been published, you're more likely to be able to claim a fair use, whereas if it's unpublished, that factor weighs against a finding of fair use. The effect of your use on the market for the work you're using and, and this is a very important factor, the amount of the work that you're using. The more you use, the less likely it is to be fair use. And of course, the less of the copyrighted work that you're using, the more likely it is to be fair use. Using a very small portion of a published work, like a biography, for a news account is probably, in most cases, going to be deemed fair use. On the other hand, the U.S. Supreme Court, in the case of Harper and Roe versus Nation, held that the use of only 300 words from President Gerald Ford's 200,000-word memoir in a 2,250-word article stepped over the line separating fair use from impermissible infringement. The court held in that case that each of the four factors weighed against a finding of fair use, primarily because even though they only used a small portion of the work, they used what the court called the heart of the work. This is definitely an area, however, in which if you have any doubt in your mind, you should consult with a lawyer and you might want to ask the person whose work you're using for permission. Although I always tell people, if you're going to ask for permission, you better be ready to abide by what the person says. Don't ask for permission, and then if the person says, no, you can't use it, don't go ahead and use it anyway. That's generally not a good idea, although in a recent case, someone did do that, and they did uh, win a court case. To illustrate what I mean about the sort of elusive aspect of fair use, Professor Nimmer the, uh, one of the primary authorities on copyright law referred to what he called the almost infinite elasticity of each of the four factors determining fair use and their concomitant inability to resolve difficult questions. So that's why I say, without tooting uh, my horn as a lawyer too much, that it's best to consult with somebody when you're contemplating the use of copyrighted material because uh, you, you certainly want to avoid being used as a laboratory animal for litigation. I hope this thumbnail summary of some of the important issues and common issues that come up with news gathering has been helpful. And uh, the, the bottom line is you can be aggressive in gathering news and you can get those important stories without stepping over the line and embroiling yourself in litigation. Thanks.